You can let go of your worries. Now I realize that you may regard that as a rather extravagant statement. But I wouldn't make this statement unless I believed it to be true. I think, as a matter of fact, that I can claim that I've never made a statement that I didn't believe in. If I did, I'd have no business standing here. And you'd better believe that you can let go of your worries, because worry is one of the most deadening influences in human personality. And once or twice every year, I try to give a little talk on the subject. And I was impelled to do this by attending a luncheon one day, and across the table from me was a well-known physician, one of the greatest in this country. And he asked me the question, how often in the year do you preach a sermon against worry? And he said, note that I underscore the word against it, not on it. I said, well, doctor, uh, I preach on it uh, every year or so. Oh, he said, that isn't nearly enough. And he added, if I were a preacher, I would preach on it very, very often. I wouldn't overwork it, but I surely would emphasize it. Because, said he, in my experience, most of the patients who have come to me would not need it, have needed to do so. Had they been sufficiently Christian not to be victims of worry, which was an impressive statement in itself. And then he added, if you were to remove from the hospital beds of this country all the people who were put there by worry, you'd have an unemployment situation in the hospitals that would be quite acute. So with this kind of urging, I decided that maybe as a kind of a spiritual doctor, it was my bounden duty to give an anti-worry treatment to the congregation now and then. Now, apparently, this has become a great national subject. Several people have sent to me a series of articles on anxiety published in the first column on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Now, I'm told that the Wall Street Journal is the most widely read newspaper from coast to coast in the United States. And I read it myself. And I think it is a great newspaper. However, these articles were, in my humble judgment, no masterpiece. They were well written, but they followed the usual line in which the reporter gave expression to the problem and quoted statistics on the problem, but no statement was given, no idea put forward as to how the problem could be solved. And of course, there was no reference to religion because the usual newspapers in these metropolitan eastern areas today are terribly afraid of the word God, like there must be an edict against it from the Supreme Court of the United States. And any article that endeavors to deal with anxiety and doesn't deal with faith is superficial because the greatest antidote to worry and anxiety is faith. Hope we are saved by. Now abideth faith. Hope 
and love. It's a motivator that keeps people going when they're going is very hard. Oh, that's what hope does for you. But you have to practice hope. You just can't come in here and hear me or anybody else talk about hope and go outside and say, that's great. I just hope I can do that. You've got to say, I believe in hope. I'm going to practice hope until I become a hopeful person. And of course, hope is a glorious thing in that it always reminds us that something better lies ahead. And something better always does lie ahead if you believe that it does. These something betters that we want, how do we get them? We create them in our own minds first. Do you want something better? Where will you attain it? You must first attain it by formulating it in your own mind. Then by believing you will come to it, that it's there. Never lose sight of it. I read a piece in the paper not long ago about a man, 86 years old, who was knocked down in the street and killed. They took him to the hospital and they performed, as was required, an autopsy. The surgeon who performed the autopsy said to his colleagues, just look at this. Look at all that's wrong inside the body of this man. This man should have been dead 20 or 25 years ago. And they tell me that he was in pretty fair health and would have lived on had he not been knocked down by this automobile and killed. So they sent for the wife. And the doctor said, this was wrong with your husband, this was wrong with your husband, this was wrong with your husband. His insides weren't in very good shape. Your husband should have been dead 20 or 25 years ago. How come he didn't die when he should? Which is a kind of a scientific way of putting it. <laughs> well, the wife said, I wouldn't know why he didn't die when he should. But I will tell you that I always remember that no matter what anybody brought up, my husband used to say, I have hopes. And he would always say to me, I will feel better tomorrow. Never did he go to bed at night saying, I don't feel well, and I'll feel worse tomorrow. I will feel better tomorrow. I have hopes. <laughs>